you are listening to Veggie Doctor Radio, and this is episode number 95.5. Hey, I'm your host, Dr. Yami. I'm a board certified pediatrician, certified health and wellness coach, author, and speaker. I'm also a passionate promoter of the power of diet and lifestyle in preventing and reversing chronic disease and bringing joy and longevity into our lives. This podcast is focused on plant-based nutrition, habit formation, motivation, and mindset so that you can have the tools to live the best life possible. Are you ready to get started? Let's do this. Uh, and C is companionship. Like when you have plants, certain plants for a long enough time, you develop a connection with them that is very much the same as your connection with like a, like a pet or something, right? They, you know, you couldn't just replace your dog with a, a, sa- a similar dog of, of the same species. And then that's not the same, right? So in the same way, I've had some plants for enough years that I feel attached to them and I don't care so much about their aesthetics. I mean, they still look good to me, right? Um, but they really do have that like real connection with me. Hello, veggie lovers. Happy Earth Day. Such a fun day for me because today is also the anniversary of my private practice, Nourish Wellness, the day that I opened my doors to my physical location. So this day has so much significance for me. And also just because what a cool day to celebrate the planet that we live on, to kind of reassess all the things that we're doing in our life to support our planet and improve sustainability. If you've been listening along this month, I have been doing a special series on sustainability and climate change. But today I want to bring you something really fun. Now, I've told you guys before, I love podcasting so much. I get to meet the coolest people. And what I love about having my own podcast is I can talk about whatever topic I want. You guys know that most of the time I'm going to talk about plant-based nutrition and habits and lifestyle medicine and cool stuff like that. But today we are going to hear from a house plant expert. So we're going to be plantastic in a whole different way. The reason I have become interested in this topic is because I myself have started to delve into taking care of house plants. Now, don't get any big ideas. Right now, I only have two plants at home and one at my office, but I feel very accomplished because I've had an orchid that has lived over a year and bloomed three times. Her name is Bella. And now I have a bromeliad that my husband gave to me this year. Her name is Betty and my money tree at my office who is named Mo. Anyway, so those are my three plant babies. And I wanted to learn more about raising house plants, how to do it well, how to do it effectively. So I started searching on Instagram and different places. And I found the Instagram account Houseplant Journal and Daryl Chang, who has this book called The New Plant Parent. And I loved his philosophy so much because it was so empowering. And you guys know that I love empowering things. I, I like to give you education and information that's going to help you feel more confident and give you the courage to try some of these new things or to persist in some of the things that you've been doing. And so I thought he would be just perfect for today. Before I get into talking more about Daryl and who he is, just want to read a review from the Apple podcast about Veggie Doctor Radio. This is from vegan underscore noir, who says, Great podcast and very informative. Thank you so much, Vegan Noir. Thank you for the short and sweet review. I really appreciate it. I just want to remind you guys that if you 
have a chance, please subscribe, rate, and review my podcast. It really makes a big difference. I really appreciate it. And I really want to take this podcast to the next level. So if you could please help me, I would really appreciate it, guys. Thank you so much. And if you haven't already subscribed to my newsletter, remember that you will get a really awesome download that has the five pillars of healthy eating, recipes, and resources. And there are two ways to do that. You can text the word fiber, F-I-B-E-R, to the number 66866, or you can go to dryami.com forward slash sign up. Thank you so much for joining, and I just love having you as part of the family. If you've ever tried to Google houseplant care advice, you'll probably be left with more questions than answers. Daryl Chang, author of The New Plant Parent and creator of Houseplant Journal, is here to help. He has helped thousands of people understand the essentials of houseplant care to become confident plant parents. Daryl's commitment to excellence, his passion for plants, and thirst for knowledge have turned him into the king of the internet houseplant world with over 400,000 followers on Instagram. Wow, so cool. I love his story. I love his approach. So much fun in this episode. I hope you'll listen. Even if you feel like you're a black thumb, I think you're going to learn a lot from this episode. Or if you're a seasoned house plant caretaker and you have lots of little plant babies, I think you'll get something from this conversation as well. Happy Earth Day, veggie lovers. I love you so much. I hope that you have a plantastic day. Enjoy this episode. Well, hello, Daryl Chang. Thank you so much for being a guest on Veggie Doctor Radio today. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, you know, one of the things I, I like to talk about a lot is plants, but I'm usually talking about eating plants and how, <laughs> you know, eating plants is so beneficial for our health. But today we're going to take plants in a whole new light. We're mm -hmm. going to talk about raising house plants. So I really appreciate having you as a guest and somebody that can enlighten us in a whole new way at looking at plants. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you for having me. Well, tell me, how did you first become interested in raising house plants? Uh, so like a lot of good uh, millennials, before I left home, uh, I was still, you know, still living with my mom. And she said, you know, help me decorate our house with some house plants. And so, you know, being a person who loves hobbies, who loves to research things, um, you know, we bought a couple of plants and then I tried to look online. I tried to get some books to figure out, you know, how to keep these things alive. Right. And, you know, it really kind of struck me that a lot of the, a lot of the stuff that I read online uh, was just kind of like missing a little bit of science. It was missing a little bit of like that kind of long-term appreciation. It, it always, it always kinds of kind of reads just like a recipe for perfection. Right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, you know, I think after, so anyway, I started an Instagram account just to sort of document like what, what's happening with my plants. And uh, I think that caught the attention of a lot of different accounts. I mean, because I guess I like taking nice photos, right? So that's sort of like Instagram's key, the key to Instagram. So I took those photos. My account got a lot of traction, especially after I started posting um, time-lapse videos, like showing how a plant rehydrates or even longer ones like how a leaf completely unfurls uh, and you know that was one side of my Instagram growth let's say and then the other side was that I wrote about plant care in a way that was um, you know trying to be a bit more specific but also trying to promote um, appreciating plants as as living things and not just purely as decor mm -hmm. um, you know and that's kind of how all of this got started and you know the the thing is when you're on social media and anybody can sort of look at your pictures and your, and your writing, uh, it caught the attention of a literary agent. And she said, Hey, I think you can write a really good book about plant care, especially with your different perspective on it. And so we put together the proposal and, um, you know, fast forward another year and a half, 
the book came out uh, about last year this time uh, in March of March of 2019. Wow, congratulations. And I've <laughs> read your book and I thought it was thank so you, helpful. So before your mom said, hey, help me with these house plants, did you have interest in them at all? Uh, I mean, they did always fascinate me. I mean, the thing, so actually back to that story about my mom asking me to do the plants is that, you know, she kind of put it on me to figure out how to take care of them. But it confused me because she said, I have a black thumb. But then I thought, but mom, you taught me how to do outdoor gardening. Like we raise, uh, you know, vegetables outside. It does, like, why is there such a disconnect, right? And so that's where I discovered that this whole narrative of green thumb, black thumb is actually very prevalent. And I would say a kind of hindrance to people really understanding how to take care of plants indoors. Oh, I, I and that was one of the places I wanted to go today. So we can just go there right now. Sure. <laughs> I mean, I, I feel like, cause I've gotten this interest suddenly. That's why I'm having you on the show today because I feel like it is something that can be overcome but I talk to a lot of people and people automatically put themselves in a box, like right off the bat, yes, yes. people say, literally they call themselves plant killers. I was calling myself mm -hmm. that too. Like, I'm like, I always say I'm better at eating plants than growing <laughs> them, you know? And, <laughs> and, and, but there's other people that automatically have this confidence and say, no, I can grow anything. I can help anything mm -hmm. thrive. So why do you think so many people automatically put themselves into this category? What makes people consider themselves, quote, plant mm -hmm. killers? I think it has a lot to do with like kind of like two main categories. Because because I mean, I've obviously now seen like thousands upon thousands of questions about plants, right? And I would say that there are two main categories of, I would say, issues that are going on at play. Number one is people's understanding of exactly how plants work is not quite clear, right? And then on the other side of it is that their expectations are that if I do proper care, everything will be perfect, mm. right? And therefore, things like yellowing leaves or brown tips, instead of understanding that there are times when that just happens, uh, it's, it's immediately seen as something wrong, right? Mm, mm -hmm. And so then it, it starts the cycle of like uh, self-blaming and thinking like, oh, I'm not good at this, right? And, and then that inevitably gets kind of like, I would say into a cycle of number one, uh, people are fixated on, on watering, but not understanding that light is what drives the whole process, right? Uh, and then it, it comes around with, oh no, yo, leave. And then I must be doing something wrong. I think I have to correct something. I got to move it around or something like that. And then this thing just spirals into what I call like ubiquitous self-blaming plant parents. <laughs> I think you can apply that to real life when you have children too. I mean, this could, <laughs> this could be applied at so many different levels. I love that. Okay. Well, you have taken a different philosophy, but before we get to your philosophy, which I love, can you tell me a little bit more about what the benefits are of houseplants in general? Why should we try to have house plants what what's good about them mm -hmm. uh so i would i would um I, I actually very recently came up with what i call like the abc of plant appreciation and this is like the three kind of broad categories that we can that that allow us to enjoy plants number one or sorry a is aesthetics like they are just visually pleasing to look at and i think you can understand that most traditional plant um care or plant uh, appreciation just kind of stops there, right? We look at them as just pretty things, right? Uh, the next one, B, is the biology. Like just plants are just intrinsically interesting because of the fact that they have approached life in a totally different way from animals. And that in itself is just fascinating to witness, right? Uh, and C is companionship. Like when you have plants, certain plants for a long enough time, you develop a connection with them that is very much the same as your connection with like a, like a pet or something, right? They, you know, you couldn't just replace your dog with a, a, sa a similar dog of, of the same species. And then that's not the same, right? Mm -hmm. So in the same way, I've had some plants for enough years that I feel attached to them and I don't care so much about their aesthetics. I mean, they still look good to me, right? Um, but they really do have that like real connection with me. Oh, I so, love that. Yeah, that's that's like the 
three broad categories of, of what I would call like a holistic way to enjoy plants in, in everything they can offer us. Mm-hmm. And definitely for, I can see that you could easily translate those things into well-being because when we mm-hmm. are able to appreciate something and have gratitude for another living thing, you know, these plants, then it can contribute to our own happiness and well-being. But what do you know about how plants change our indoor air quality and, you know, what's going on inside our homes? Do you know Mm -hmm. much about that? Uh, Okay. So this is an interesting uh, uh, issue because it's, it's, it's often been brought up that there was a NASA study in the 1980s that said that certain plants uh, are, have ability to filter the air. Um, Now the problem is with, uh, you know what? I'm, it's perfect that I'm talking to you about this because I'm sure that you have encountered um, maybe some headlines that misrepresent some other study, right? Absolutely. Especially when it comes to human health. That, I think that's that's probably more more so the case with with human studies, right? Uh, well, unfortunately, this is the case with this NASA study, mm. and it's like we have to look at it with with scientific literacy and understand that. This NASA study was done in like sealed boxes in controlled environments. Uh, and also the fact that we have a more recent understanding of soil microbes, which are really the ones doing the, the, the air filtering and not necessarily just like the leaf tissues of the plant, right? So it's, I mean, I hate to burst the bubble of, of hope here, but it's like <laughs> plants themselves don't really filter the air to the degree that uh, would be would be touted in a in a commercial to say that you should therefore buy like 50 plants and your air will be clean like that's not really really the case <laughs> all right well no thanks for giving us the honest truth and that's why i have to have an expert on here because otherwise we would all just still be believing that but regardless even if the plants aren't filtering our air they're giving us benefits not just the yes, aesthetics, absolutely. the the appreciation of their biology and the companionship but also another hobby to have something that we can learn and grow from uh, another challenge, yes. which is how I'm approaching it right now as well. All right. Mm-hmm. So now on to your philosophy, you know, when you first started this journey, you were looking on the internet, maybe you bought some plants and read the little tags, which is what I used to do. Just read the tags and try to understand what it means, but how is your overall house plant philosophy different from the usual advice that we may encounter on the internet or the little tags that come with the plants. Mm-hmm. So uh, I want to circle back to the the uh, kind of traditional philosophy that people approach plant care with. If I do this perfectly, the plant will look perfect all the time, right? And I think that that is really what is spinning around in people's heads every time they go and research anything related to plants. So my philosophy right away tries to pull you a little bit away from that, right? Uh, So number one, I say is uh, to understand your environmental conditions. And that means that you have to understand that if your windows, uh, I don't know, face another building and that the sun doesn't shine through for that many hours, you have to understand that that is a limitation of your environment. Um, Whereas for some people who seem to do so well with plants, maybe if you just looked at the size and how how unobstructed their windows are, they, they probably just have huge windows, right? So number one is an understand your environmental conditions. Number two is try your best with care, which implies that, you know, we are all busy people. We have lives to live. We can't 100% devote our time to taking care of the plant. So we have to understand what's feasible for us. We have to understand that if you can't, um, you know, lift a heavy pot uh, to water it or something like that, maybe then you shouldn't try and have so many big plants. You can have fewer smaller plants, something like that, right? Mm. Um, so that's number two is to, to try your best. Number three is to let nature take its course. And this one, I think, is the, the most important because it now doesn't, it doesn't kind of limit you to say that if the plant doesn't look so nice, it's therefore completely your fault. And I think that's, that's something that people naturally gravitate towards right like whenever they see a plant and if it's not looking so hot they say oh who's taking care of this right uh that's 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 going back to the whole like perfect care equals perfect plants philosophy that people are are naturally already um predisposed to so understand your conditions try your best and let nature take its course when you have all three of these then 
you you kind of like take a more holistic view of the fact that this is a living thing it is influenced by its environment and also your care but ultimately it is a living thing that will you know grow its course however genetics and and nature determines right i just i i just my brain is spinning right now because i love this so much the title of your book is the new plant parent and mm-hmm. you're talking about raising plants and you know being a first time parent to plants but this applies so much to human <laughs> children as much it's so much that it's just like mind blowing to me i love mm-hmm. how your advice and the way that you approach it is so practical and adaptable but also forgiving knowing that these plants aren't supposed to look like picture perfect all the time. And if they're Mm -hmm. not, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're doing something wrong. So it's no need to panic. And all of a sudden, like you said, change everything up and and Mm -hmm. be doubting yourself. So that is such a great philosophy. Well, one of the things I learned from your book is really the most important thing when it comes to raising houseplants, which you've already mentioned. But for some reason, I never quite understood until you wrote it down. So can you tell us what is the number one factor that determines plant health? Okay. The the number one factor that determines plant health is it's light, right? Now, if I just stop there, then most people immediately fixate on, oh, therefore I need to give the plant as much sun as possible, right? Mm -hmm. And, And the thing is, we really need to differentiate between when the sun is shining, you're like when your plant has direct line of sight with the sun and versus when it's not there, what else is providing you light? So here, here's, the, here's a scenario that I use to describe, like to, to sort of help illustrate the importance of light, right? So let's say you buy a plant and the tag says low light. So therefore you think that you can put it over in a dark corner, right? You put it in the corner, and then the tag also says water it once a week. So you're doing the water once a week thing. And then after about five weeks, it starts to look really ugly. And then you're kind of like losing interest in taking care of it. You maybe even throw it away. So fine. You want to try again. You, you buy the same plant. And this time you try and say, okay, maybe I just need to learn better how to water. But so, so then you start reading and now you're digging around and finding that, oh, they say to wa- wait until the soil is drier. Maybe you need to pot it with something with more drainage. You need to use terracotta pots. You do all this stuff. You still put it in the dark corner and now you're waiting till the soil dries. And let's say now that takes two weeks. Well, now you're watering every two weeks. And let's say now eight weeks later, the plant is still looking just as bad as it did before. The, the issue is not that you didn't water properly. The issue is that there was no light to drive the whole photosynthesis uh, process. Uh, in order to understand like what light is for a plant, if I put the plant in a dark corner, that's like telling a person, you know, for the next six months, you're only going to get to live if I give you one slice of bread a day. Like it's right down to the food, right? Because that's what photosynthesis is for. And I know that's kind of a harsh illustration, but I, I think people won't understand that unless I kind of slap them a little bit with it, right? And, and only in that way will people understand that, you know, you, we're fixated on watering because that's the thing that the human needs to remember to do. And so by a human-centered approach, we're thinking, oh, what do I have to do? What do I have to do for this plant? But the plant needs to do its own work first by, by first being placed where it gets adequate light. Only then will your watering uh, routine or whatever, like do anything good for the plant. Yes, man. And I mean, and really, I was just one of those people that didn't really get that, <laughs> even though <laughs> I've, you know, have higher education and been through all my biology classes. But I think you're right is you get the tag and it says low light and your brain's thinking, oh, well, I can put it anywhere. You know, it doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. But I love the, the line that you have in your book that is plants eat sunlight you know plants mm-hmm. eat light and i was like oh duh you know so now it kind of makes sense all these poor plants that i have been gracefully starving as you put in your book like there's some plants that just they are able to withstand that starvation a little mm-hmm. bit longer but they're still starving so i feel really really guilty now for all the plants that i've gracefully starved over the years <laughs> I, I would say that like the 
the whole like thrives in low light. And I'm saying this with air quotes here. Um, I think that was a miscommunication between horticulturalists and, and interior designers. See, wow. horticulturalists, when they define low light, they're talking about like under a forest canopy, the sun may not peer through directly for several hours at a time. Maybe it just shoots through a little bit of the holes in the tree lines. And, and even then in a forest, it's not pitch black, right? The, the forest canopy is not opaque to the sky. Uh, so if I was to measure it, like I'm an engineer, so I love to have measurements. I love to have data, right? If you measure uh, the light under a forest canopy, you're probably going to get in a neighborhood of 100 foot candles to maybe 300 foot candles. And foot candles is just a measurement of light that horticulturalists use. Um, so, you know, let's say it's in the 100 to 300 range for most of the day. But once you come inside, you know, your walls and your ceiling are opaque. They, they are, it is like the inside of your house is more like a cave with an opening and the opening is the window, mm -hmm. right? So at first, when I used to give advice about, about light, at, at first I would say to people, oh, just measure it and make sure you don't have anything less than 200 foot candles. But the problem is, you know, not everyone has a light meter. Not everyone is crazy like me. I walk around with my light meter and I just want to know what light is everywhere, right? <laughs> Uh, so instead of doing the light meter thing, I looked at the situation and I said, okay, I have 200 foot candles right now. What is the environmental context that gives me 200 foot candles? And that was when I was standing next to the, like close to the window with, with an adequately wide view of the sky. You see, when it comes to light, it's very obvious to know that the sun is shining on the spot, right? Mm -hmm. But if you measure it, that's probably going to be in the neighborhood of 3,000 to 6,000 foot candles. But if the sun is not in sight, but I'm measuring 200 foot candles, well, what's the difference between 200 and 800? It's if I move closer to the window, getting a wider view of the sky. Mm -hmm. and, and you know, me going through all this explanation, it's like, it's, it's a mouthful to explain all of this, right? So if the person is not willing to buy a light meter and understand the, the dynamics of light, then the simplest way I can describe quote unquote bright indirect light is put your plant where it has the widest possible view of the sky. And number two, if the sun is going to shine on that spot for longer than say two or three hours, then you should block it with a white uh, sheer curtain. And only by saying all of that can I kind of, you know, eliminate all the ambiguity that comes from saying, oh, bright indirect light, oh, you're high, medium, low. Like that, that has no context unless I have numbers. And again, unless you have a light meter, there's no way for people to, to sort of uh, calibrate their understanding with a light meter unless I calibrate it with like literally the view of the sky, like the width of the view of the sky. Yeah. Well, I mean, it helped me so much for your description that way, because I can go around my house and look at areas where it's not going to be suitable to have a plant. And Absolutely. beforehand, I would have taken that first approach of like, oh, I want to plant here because this is where I have a space and I need to fill in this <laughs> space, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so definitely that helped. And for people that really do want to nerd out more, if you read Daryl's book, he talks about different light meters or even apps, which I haven't explored yet. So right now I'm just trying to get my overall basic view. I have one plant that has lived for over a year. So I feel like mm -hmm. I deserve a trophy. It's an orchid. It's beautiful. Her name is Bella. And so I oh, told my nice. husband this year that I think I'm ready for another one because he gave me for Valentine's the orchid last year. So he got me this year a bromeliad. Thank you for identifying it for me on Instagram. Mm -hmm. And after reading your book, I was able to see, okay, so these usually live, like they're from Brazil originally, and this is the kind of area it lives in. So now it makes more sense. Like put yourself in the position of that plant. What kind of light is it used to having in its natural habitat and its natural conditions? And it makes so much more sense to me. So I was able to pick a place in my house where it has that type of light and we'll see how long it goes. <laughs> <Nice. by>. So <laughs> good experiment. Okay. Now, so the other, Oh, actually, can I, can uh, I quickly interject about the bromeliad? So again, back to the biology part, uh, a bromeliad after it flowers, meaning it has those colorful bract, mm -hmm. bracts, which is the technical name of that flower. Um, after it flowers, the main plant will 
eventually die, right? Uh, and what's going to happen is if the light has been good for the plant, then uh, during the time when the mother plant dies, little babies will grow off of the bottom. Mm -hmm. So you should be paying attention to like the little crevices inside the leaves and just keep looking to make sure that, uh, or to hope that those babies are emerging um, because after the bromeliad flowers, it, it dies. And that's just the biology. There's no like saving it or anything. <laughs> okay. Well, yeah. And I'm glad you told me that. So that way I can be aware and know that I'm not just like a total failure. And mm -hmm. I think it's adorable that you said they're called pups. Is that oh, correct? Yeah, absolutely. They're yeah. Cute. They're they're called pups. And like so many plants uh, grow this way, they effectively make little little versions of themselves growing off of the of the, off the main plant. And that's something like so fascinating to watch. Yeah. So cool. Well, I'm excited to see that that transition. Another thing that you talk about in your book is that when people get a new plant, immediately they want to bring it home. They want to put in a new pot. They want to get soil and fertilizer and all of those kinds of things. But you mm -hmm. talk about an adjustment period. Can you tell us a little bit more about that adjustment period that plants must make when you first bring them into your home? Sure. Uh, so when we talk about uh, adjustment period, what, I, what I'm really saying is that the conditions under which the plant has been growing in the commercial nursery are completely different than what they are going to get when they're in your home. Uh, so I, I talked about how, like, if you imagine an Olympically, Olympic trained athlete, right? She, she trains world-class uh, uh, facilities and has great nutrition. Uh, but then the year before the Olympics, she has to come and live at your house, right? <laughs> you, you know, you don't have the world-class facilities. You, you probably don't eat the same type of nutrition that she's used to getting. So, you know, her body's going to change a little bit, right? But certainly she's not dying. Uh, you're, as long as you're trying your best to, to keep that person well-fed and, and such, right? So the same goes for plants. Like they're, they're not going to look the same as they did. Uh, when they came from the nursery in another year, let's say, because for that, for the previous uh, parts of its life, it was growing under like super ideal conditions. When I talked about foot candles, like we're talking about between a thousand and five thousand foot candles for for the plant uh, for eight hours of the day. You know, even if you had a skylight, you're probably not getting that type of light. Um, and the other thing would be, you know, high higher temperature during the day and lower temperature during night. You know, in your home, it's generally the same, roughly the same temperature, right? Uh, and humidity is another big one. The greenhouse humidity is is well above sixty percent most of the time inside your house. Um, I know in the winter it could be down to like twenty percent, but in the summer it's generally roughly the same as outside, right? But basically, what I'm saying is the indoor conditions are just so different. I would almost argue that they are harsh for the plant, right? Mm -hmm. And that you just need to let the plant uh, shed some of its older leaves. Like I talk about yellowing leaves as as not not as just something that the plant is dying, but really more like the way a company, if its revenue annual revenue has has been reduced, they have to reduce headcount. They have to cut employees in order to make the whole balancing books right. Exactly the same principles are happening to leaves. Like if you look at leaves, if you look at most of the leaves that turn yellow and fall off the plant, if you notice, they're most likely the oldest leaves, the lowest ones on the, the stem or something, right? And that naturally has to happen. It's not something that you should uh, frantically aim to try and avoid. It's, it, it happens naturally. I, I recently wrote a blog post where I went and visited a conservatory. This is where you know plants are grown in beautiful conditions and they've been there for many years. Mm -hmm. and all of their leaves have brown tips. All of their all of their leaves eventually, like I've seen many examples of like big huge fiddle leaf figs and, and all a whole bunch of lower leaves are all turning yellow and eventually fall off. Uh, which means that if it can happen there, it's going to happen in your home. Yeah. And then that goes back to your philosophy of you know, we have to kind of change our expectations about these plants. They're not going to mm -hmm. look picture perfect. They came from ideal, optimal conditions where they were made to thrive so that they look beautiful so that we're more likely to buy them. And then we bring <laughs> yes. them home. And I like how you said, when you bring it home, try to keep 
more things the same. So don't change the pot right away because the pot that it was in was probably good while it was there at the nursery. Mm -hmm. So really our main job when we bring it home is to optimize the light situation for the plant and then mm-hmm. see, let it adjust to our home yes. before we make any other big changes. And don't get all worried and stuff about soil and fertilizing. Cause that's what I would get stressed out. Okay, what kind of fertilizer do I need to have? And mm-hmm. do I need to change the pot right away? Those kinds of things. But again, I think some when people think of the when people are worried about those things, they're worried because I worry about those because I don't want to see yellowed leaves. I worry about those things because I don't want to see brown tips. And yes. and and my suggestion is that's going to happen regardless of mm-hmm. what you do. Mm-hmm. So, like the, the 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 driver for whether or not to repot a plant. I mean, if we're going to talk about repotting, um, you know, there is a a correct time to repot a plant. Number one, it's if the plant has been in its soil for for a very long time, i.e., between a year to to several years, depending on like the size of the pot. That's the first key, uh, key, uh, sort of sign you're looking for. The second thing is that the roots have uh, grown to such an extent that they encircle the base of the pot a lot. This is a condition uh, called root bound. And you know this happens because as foliage grows higher and higher, roots keep getting longer and longer, but because they're contained in the pot, they just go round and round. So usually what I do before I check if it's gonna repot is I think about how long has the plant been in here? If it's been longer than let's say a year, then I'll say, okay, now I'm gonna check the roots. I literally have to unpot the plant and look at the root situation to see if it's uh, a good time to repot it. And if, if it is, then, then I repot it. Okay, that's great advice. So you may have already answered this, but what do you think is the biggest house plant myth or mistake? Um, I, yeah, I did kind of already answer that with a very broad stroke of saying like, people think perfect care equals perfect plants. Mm -hmm. Um, I I would also then maybe if I go to the second one, which would be, uh, that, that they don't, people don't tend to understand the the connection between water usage and, and light intensity and duration. Uh, it, sometimes when you read plant care, you, you read it as though watering and light are just separate uh, factors that are all just in the mix, right? And if I was to relate this to uh, like a recipe, light is not just one of the ingredients. The ingredients for plants is carbon dioxide and water. Mm-hmm. Light is, is the oven that powers the reaction that actually gets it to go together. Mm-hmm. So, you know, when you read a recipe, the oven is not listed as an ingredient. The oven is just assumed that you have one and that it mm-hmm. works. So that's where I think people need to understand is where light fits into the whole biological system of a plant. Yeah. And kind of going back to what you were talking about at the beginning, if you got that plant that said low light and you put it in a corner Mm -hmm. and it's not using light, so it's not doing that reaction then it may not be using as much water. So you can actually overwater the plant when it, you totally, have lower yes. light. And it's one of those things that I, like you said, they're related, they're interrelated, they work together. So I did mm. not really know that and understand that. So now it makes more sense to me, depending on how much light your plant needs, that's a relationship that you need to kind of watch in the soil and how the plant is doing and really just being in tune with your plant. You know, it's, it's kind of like a really cool thing to think about your plant to be able to observe it, see how it's doing, touch the soil, see how the leaves are. It's a whole mm-hmm. different way of thinking about it rather than just looking at the tag and doing what the tag says. Yeah, yeah. And and another thing you brought up too about, about the watering and overwatering is that, you know, I'm sure you've heard this the saying of overwatering is the number one killer of houseplants, right? And my my argument to that is it's not watering too much or too often that makes a plant get root rot. It's not understanding that light is what drives water usage, right? Because if I, again, back to the story, if I had put that plant right up close to the window, then the only way that I'm going to cause root rot or quote unquote overwatering is if I'm literally like soaking it every single day, right? Mm -hmm. But if the frequency of watering uh, can be varied and yet the plant still survives, then we shouldn't be fixated on like, getting a frequency right. We should be fixated on 
knowing what the proper cue is to water a plant, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and of course, making sure that that water is even being used in the first place, i.e. by putting it close to the window. When I, like when I talk about watering now, I, I, I've come up with this good analogy to say that, you know, how often do you put gas in your car? If, if I say that I have a Honda Civic and I put gas in my car once a week, that doesn't mean that if you also have a Honda Civic that you also must put the gas in once a week. It's, it's a combination of the car and also my own usage, right? So the, 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 the rationale behind the frequency of watering needs to, be, it needs to be based on like a soil dryness cue and not just, not just a time cue, right? Mm -hmm. But every plant does have a difference as far as how dry they like the soil, right? Yes, so you just kind of have to also learn your plant and what it desires, what it likes to have. Yeah. And, and you know what? So the, the second part of that lesson is that there are only really three broad categories of, of soil dryness cues. The first type is keep the soil evenly moist. If you think about your ferns, like maidenhair fern especially, any very thin leaves plants where, where they're used to being in the rainforest, where it literally rains every day, those are the plants where their soil needs to be mostly moist all the time. Mm -hmm. All right. The second type is you let the soil get to partial dryness before you water it again. And this applies broadly to like your tropical foliage plants, the plants that are a bit thicker that can store a bit of water in their tissues, right? And the very last type is water when the soil is absolutely bone dry. This is your cacti, your succulents, anything that has really, really fat leaves that store, like they're used to infrequent rainfall, so they have to store as much water they can inside their bodies. And if you really, if you, if you think about only these three categories, now when you go and look up any plant care advice, you're only gonna find those three. If there's nothing, there's no other, uh, there's no other different permutation of it. That's great. No, this, I think this is going to help so many people because I know I'm going to come back and listen to this episode again and again, <laughs> as I learn more about house plants. But speaking of that, so say somebody has considered themselves a plant killer, like I used mm -hmm. to, I'm no longer in that category, by the way, I feel I have, I have more confidence now, but say nice, a nice. person's like a black thumb or a, a plant killer. How do you think, what would be your advice? Like if they wanted to start having house plants, where should they start? Because it seems like it's overwhelming. Like what kind of plant do you choose? Do you choose it based upon what looks good to you? Or do you choose it based upon what's quote easier to take care of? I know you probably don't like that term, but <laughs> how do you start? Uh, I would, I would say first, just look at what windows you possibly have, right? If your window, uh, the sun is shining through it for most hours of the day, well, then your options for what plants you can have there and that will grow well are more numerous than, let's say, if you had a north-facing window where the sun never shines, but maybe it's not that obstructed, right? Mm -hmm. So first thing I would do is evaluate your space. I, I think because effectively what I, what I try to encourage people to think of their indoor space as is not just you're decorating with plants, but rather you want to foster an indoor garden. And the thing that gardeners, like outdoor gardeners, understand is that they are at the mercy of nature. So they don't buy um, plants that don't suit the light conditions. They don't buy plants that don't suit their, um, you know, growing zones and all that stuff, right? Mm -hmm. So indoors, we kind of need to establish the same sorts of, um, I guess, standards, right? Mm -hmm. So basically, any plant that you look at that says that it can handle low light can be, a, a, you know, a good starter plant provided you put the plant where it has the widest possible view of the sky. Uh, so snake plant, ZZ plant, philodendrons, pothos, all of these plants that are considered easy and low light, put them right in front of your windows. All right. Now the next step is uh, watering, I guess is the, probably the easiest next step, right? Don't try and think that you need to follow a frequency. Instead, think of it more like, I need to regularly check on the soil, you know, every couple of days, right? So when you check the soil, if it's still, um, you know, mostly, mostly wet or mostly heavy from having water in there, then you don't water. Uh, for the snake plant, let's say, or ZZ plant, only when the soil is totally, totally dry, then take it to your sink, soak it nice and evenly moist and let the extra water drain away. And now you lift the pot and it's nice and heavy. That's a fully watered plant 
and then put it back by the window. If you do that with a snake plant and a ZZ plant, you'll probably enjoy that plant for like five or six years. Mm. Uh, something like a pothos, because those grow a bit more vigorously, uh, at some point you may start to notice like a couple of months in that some of the lower leaves are starting to yellow. Now, sometimes that's interpreted as like, oh, a bad thing, you got to go replace the nutrients or whatever. But a few here and there is nothing to worry about. The plant is still living, right? Mm -hmm. um, but eventually what does happen is that you will need to repot it in order to replenish nutrients or you need to start uh, using fertilizer in your water, right? So I don't know, it, it's sort of like a, I want to try and, and just start the whole experience to be, to start you off on the, on the best foot possible, right? Yeah. Putting it by the window is the, is the number one thing that you need to do and think about the way that the plant works as it's a little uh, solar powered sugar factory. It, it has to work that way, right? And then in I terms of, your care, it's like you got to be watching the soil dryness to water. It's not that, oh, I watered it this week. I shouldn't water it next week. It's like it's got to be by observing the soil. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So first, evaluate your space and see how much light you have. If you have one of those houses where you have a ton of natural light, you may have more options. Yes. If your light options are limited, then start with one of these lower light ones. But still it needs to go next to the window so that it can Absolutely. have the widest view of the light. And then after that, start learning your plant to make sure you check in with it at least every couple of days, see how the soil is doing, and then you can continue to observe it and learn from it. Mm -hmm. is, is it possible to live in a living space or to have a house where it's not suited for any kind of plant? Uh, I mean, if you lived in, let's say, like a basement flat and your, and your windows are very low to the ground and maybe there's another house right beside it and it's blocking the view. Um, you know, if I was to take a light meter and I would measure it, if it never gets any higher than say 30 foot candles, then, you know, you, you're, no plant would, would grow all that well there. Right. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in, instead of just trying to sell you more plants, I should be trying to say, well, no, you, you have to understand that plants need an environment to grow. And if your environment is not suitable to grow, then you, you have to accept that. Now, when I say that, I don't mean, that doesn't mean you can never have plants. If you really, really want to have plants, there's grow lights. Yeah. Grow lights, uh, especially are, you know, especially in today's day and age with LED technology, um, we've been able to make light at far more efficiency in terms of like usage of electricity and also brightness. and you know, less heat and also a much cleaner spectrum if, of light because, you know, sunlight has all the colors of the rainbow in it very strongly, but other types of light, their distribution, their spectral distribution is not quite the same, uh, but LED is getting pretty close. Mm -hmm. So it is a definitely an option and something that I've used too. Like uh, I really wanted to have um, these ferns growing inside my shower, but my, my bathroom has no windows at all. So what I did was on the other side of the glass of the shower, I had LED grow lights that were shining on the plant and I flipped the cycle around where it was on for 12 hours overnight and off during the day. So effectively that acted like a, like a kind of night light for the bathroom to be lit up. Um, but that allowed those ferns to grow in there for almost a year. Wow, that's so cool. So even if you don't have a lot of natural light, it's not impossible. You could look into getting grow lights. You can have your mm -hmm. little plant friend if you so desire, but there could be places where the natural light is not ideal for growing a thriving plant. So that's great. So what about if a plant dies? And I'm assuming that there's some, just like you said, my bromeliad, if it doesn't have pups, then I'm, that's it. It's gone. <laughs> is there like a debrief period? Like if, if you're trying, you know, and you're, you're, trying to be patient and adaptable and everything with this plant, but it still dies on you. Is there mm -hmm. steps that you should take to try to determine why? Uh, you know, I would say, well, first I would say in terms of the issue of whether a plant dies on you versus it just grows into a shape that you're no longer inspired to take care of it anymore and you quietly throw it away. <laughs> you know, that, that is a very real possibility. And I think it needs to be said because that's, I would say it makes up more than 50% of the 
you know, people who call themselves quote unquote plant killers, right? Mm. Uh, and, and honestly, I've done that too. A plant is just no longer interesting for me to take care of. And it, it's growing all gangly or something like that. And it's just not, you know, bringing that joy anymore. So then sometimes, or, or another thing too is pests. Like if pests start to infest it and, you know, I just can't really get rid of them. I will do what I call like banishing it to outdoors to live the rest of its days until winter comes and takes it away. Right. Mm -hmm. But anyway, uh, oh, we're talking about, oh yeah, plants dying on you. Well, for me, because I'm so adamant about understanding the conditions and, and acknowledging that I've tried my best at that point, then I have to accept that maybe that species of plant just cannot uh, do well enough for me in the light condition that I have. Right. Mm -hmm. So for example, perfect example, fiddle leaf fig, everybody loves it, right? I don't really love it all that much because I've never had windows big enough and unobstructed enough to have a fiddle leaf fig grow to a satisfactory degree for me over any time. So I'm just not really drawn towards it anymore. Mm -hmm. And that's sort of like this whole thing of not um, feeling like you're totally in control of the plant. Like you have to remember that your environment could just not be suitable for the plant. Yeah. And so don't take it personally, especially if you did your best and it's just a learning situation. Maybe that type of plant just isn't going to do well in your environment. So I, I like that approach too, because I do think that we do take it personally. You know, it's yeah, like, yeah. dang, why didn't you <laughs> live? <laughs> you know? Yeah. And we, I think we casually take it very personally because, uh, it's kind of cute to think of it as it was your responsibility, right? Mm -hmm. And but but I think on a deeper level, that thinking kind of um, hurts the industry of plants in general and the whole hobby, right? Because yeah. if we make it all about it was all my fault, then why would I continue with a hobby where I feel like I'm always blaming myself, right? Yeah. So I'm trying to give you reason not to blame yourself and to continue with the hobby, like try different plants and find the ones that do well in your space and then you will like they'll bring you joy right yeah oh i love it that's so great okay so i want to know if you have a moment to tell us about your biggest house plant disaster do you have yes. any good stories to make us all I, feel better about ourselves i, I do i do um so <laughs> this has to do with a pest called thrips and the the interesting fact about thrips is that whether it's singular or plural, it's always thrips with an S at the end. <laughs> I always it. have to mention that anyway. But <laughs> so, you know, one of my plants, maybe a couple, I brought them home and I noticed these tiny little uh, black insects, very slow crawling on, on the surface of the leaf, right? And that's one way you can identify them. The other way you can identify them is that uh, if you look really closely, their larvae are like light yellow and even smaller and crawl around on the leaves. So anyway, I noticed them on a couple of my plants. Unfortunately, I tried to fight them, meaning I tried to fight them with pesticides and things uh, for, for too long, such that they started to spread to my other plants. Oh no. And I, what, what ended up happening was I had to throw away about like a good dozen plants. And, but there was just a few that I just could not bear to throw away. And this is another issue about pests, which is that sometimes your number one course of action is to throw away the plant because you don't want to spread to the rest of your collection. Um, anyway, this is now three years that I'm pretty sure I'm still fighting the same strain of thrips that is on now, like maybe just two or three of my plants, like literally the same generation, like I sorry, the same, the same like genetic line of thrips that has been going on for the past three years. And all because there was one or two plants I just couldn't bear to throw away and they lasted long enough to spread the, the pest to other, to other plants. And so I guess I'm sort of like um, a little bit PTSD when I look at a leaf and I'm like, Oh my God, is it a thrips? And <laughs> yeah, so it's, it's uh, that's, that's my story. <laughs> oh man, that's painful though. You know, because especially for you. I mean, I, I've seen pictures of all your plants and you just have so many beautiful plants and I know you've put so much time and care into them. So whenever mm -hmm. you feel like you have to throw them away for something like that, that's really painful. Yeah. Do you name <laughs> your plants? 
Uh, no, I actually don't name them at all, uh, but I do talk to them. Like okay, that, well, that was like, my next question is, <laughs> do you feel like talking to them helps them grow better? Uh, again, it's one of these like uh, kind of cutesy <laughs> ideas, right? And um, I think the, the psychological effect of paying attention to your plants helps them grow better because if you care about enough about something to talk to it, then you also care enough to check on its soil. You also care enough to, to check on its leaves, right? You also care enough to make sure that there, it hasn't started getting any like early signs of like pest infestation. So the, the, the actual act of talking, I'm not sure if there's any um, real evidence for that, but for sure, the, uh, the psychological uh, effect of saying that you're aware of the plant's presence and that you, you care enough to, to speak to it is a, a real thing. Yeah, no, I agree with that. I mean, it's crazy, but I feel like I've developed this bond with this orchid, you know, that I've like really worked hard for me because, you know, yeah. before I don't think I was doing the right things. <laughs> and I really I can see it flowering feel, in the background. There. Yeah, isn't she beautiful? So Very I nice. feel like when I talk to her and when I put attention to it, it's helping me. It's benefiting me. Like I feel that love and gratitude in my chest. And I can just see for people that maybe they can't have a pet because that's a little too high maintenance. But if they start to raise a house plant and develop that bond, I feel like it could have so many positive psychological effects for people that may need to just start fostering some of those feelings mm -hmm. of love and compassion and wake those up again. So I completely agree with that. Yeah, I, to I totally understand too. Also, like when you think about the, they always talk about the benefits of going into like a forest or a natural space, right? Mm -hmm. The reason why the forest does that to us is because it's, it's showing you this place is, is, is fertile. This place is where plants can thrive, right? Mm -hmm. And so you immediately understand that, okay, therefore, I can be safe here or, or I can thrive here too, right? Yeah. So th we get the same benefit from houseplants, but the only problem is the fact that if we put them in the dark corner, then it also reminds us this place is not for plants. <laughs> exactly. What do you wish more people knew? About plants or in general? or uh, okay, let's About anything. <laughs> About anything. <laughs> uh, I think that um, plant care, plant care is living with plants is is more than just about yourself right it's about our connection to the environment it's about appreciating how there's different life forms out there um that that have learned to survive in a way that's totally different from you and that's something that should uh at least for me it, it opens up my eyes to the to the curiosity of science and to want to understand biology and and all this stuff and it's just yeah, I think that's 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 how I see plants as like a window to to that that bigger world. I love it. That's beautiful. Well, what personal habit are you most proud of? How did you develop it and how do you maintain it? And it could be about anything. It doesn't have to be related to plants. <laughs> um well, I mean, I since my brain is on plants, uh I would uh I would say it's that I have a very a very good developed habit of understanding how to enjoy living with plants and accepting all, all of its parts of its life cycle, all of its um, blemishes and imperfections, and that it makes for a very rewarding hobby. And um, there was one time I did a talk where I said, you know, if you develop this habit, then you're going to be able to enjoy plants no matter who says it's cool right mm -hmm. it'll go beyond the time of this trend when eventually you know let's say the interior designers decide we want to go back to minimalism no no more plants right yeah. uh but regardless i will always enjoy having plants around mm -hmm. and that's something that i think uh, is is a habit that needs to be cultivated wow so great and, and so great that it was your mom that inspired you to take this <laughs> journey and now look where it's brought you you know that's just know, yeah, so it's, amazing it's so crazy, awesome yes. Well, Daryl, can you tell us how my listeners can connect with you? If you want to tell us where we can buy your book, hopefully people will be inspired to check out your book. And what services do you provide? 
Sure. Uh, so number one, the book uh, is called The New Plant Parent, and it's available um, anywhere books are sold, like Amazon or, or Barnes & Noble in Canada, Indigo. So anywhere. And um, in terms of how to reach me, I'm on Instagram at Houseplant Journal. Uh, and recently I opened up... So if you want plant help, like help to understand your plants, then I've recently opened up an email address called help at houseplantjournal.com. And what I want to do and achieve with this is, uh, you know, people can send me their pictures and say, what's wrong with my plant? And then I'll usually come back with some follow-up questions saying like, show me the space it lives in. Tell me what your thought process is on watering and, and fertilizing and that kind of stuff. And, and I hope that therefore I can uh, understand and have more data on how plants grow in, in real spaces, right? And also how, how people think about plant care. I want, to, I want to actually know how people think about it, right? So this has been a super helpful thing. Like right now I'm at like about 500 emails. Wow. Uh, and it's, uh, but I mean, the only thing I ask in return, and it's totally free. The only thing I ask in return is that I can post the pictures and the questions on my website so that other people can help. And of course, no personal info is ever uh, you know, posted as well. So yeah, that's help at houseplantjournal.com, uh, Instagram at houseplantjournal, and the book is called The New Plant Parent. Awesome. And you're, you're in Toronto, Canada, correct? Yes. And you do, in your area, you do consults, it looks like? Like you'll go to people's spaces and stuff like that? Yes, yes, that's right. Uh, so what I, I have done in a couple of times where, um, you know, sometimes people already have a little collection of plants and they just want me to take a look at them. And so then I'll be able to, to evaluate, you know, all those things that I just said in the email part, but now I can do it in person, which is a lot faster. Mm -hmm. uh, and then also it's a little bit of a, you know, coaching about thinking about light and that kind of thing. And of course the, you know, don't get caught in the perfection mindset kind of thing. And yeah. so that's a service that I offered for people, uh, you know, within Toronto. And actually aside from that too, is that I've recently been doing a lot of uh, speaking engagements, uh, mm -hmm. mostly at uh, plant shops and, and nurseries. Um, it's just the way that, you know, the customers can come in and kind of have a, open Q&A and also kind of hopefully inspiring discussion about uh, more ways to appreciate houseplants. I love it. Wow. You're doing amazing work. I I'm really appreciate you and everything that you're doing out there. Thank so I'm glad so I much, found man. you. So can you please leave us with a call to action? So what can my listeners do this week to improve their lives? And it can be plant related. If you want to give us a call to action on plants, that would be great. Mm -hmm. uh, I would say that Wherever you have a houseplant, you should put your eyes down to the level where the plant is and ask yourself what, what my plant sees, like what is physically in front of the environment around my plant. And if it's not the widest possible view of the sky, then that could be the reason why the plant is languishing. And to remember that plants are living things and they need light and that light is not a simple matter of just sun or no sun. It is also about the, the view of the sky. And therefore, it should be maximized uh, when it comes to indoor plants. Awesome. Okay. So for those of you that already have some house plants, put your eyes down to the level of your house plant and ask yourself, what can my plant see from where mm -hmm. it's at? Is it the widest view of the sky? So that is a great call to action. Daryl, thank you so much. I will definitely be using your, your helpline, your help email address, I'm sure, as I get braver please, please, and please. try out to um, try to grow some more plants in my home. But thank you so much for everything you do. And thank you so much for being on Veggie Doctor Radio. And I hope that you have a plantastic day. I know that you will every day have a plantastic day. <laughs> Thank you very much, Yanni. Really appreciate it. I hope that you enjoyed today's episode. Thank you for tuning in. And I look forward to having you back again next week. A very special thank you to the band Rocket Surgeons for permission to use the broccoli song. To find out more about the Rocket Surgeons, please visit their website at rocketsurgeonsband.com or Facebook at Rocket Surgeons Music. Please subscribe so that you never miss an episode. Also, all of my social media links can be found in the podcast description. Send me a message and let me know what you think of today's podcast. 
sharing is caring. Please share, rate, and review my podcast and drop me a line if you have ideas for future episodes. Thank you once again and have a plantastic day. We're having broccoli.